South Africa, of course, a water scarce country at the best of times, but are things getting worse? Now, um, our water scarcity, we are told, is mainly due to various factors like climate change, increasing water demand as well. And both the failing water infrastructure and the ever increasing population have also exacerbated the water crisis in South Africa. Uh, solutions such as fixing broken and aging infrastructure that includes uh, wastewater treatment plants are, of course, costly and will take some effort and finance from government. So to discuss how South Africa can overcome its water challenges and avoid a water crisis, we now joined virtually by Anya Duplessis, Associate Professor and a Research Specialist in Water Resource Management at the University of South Africa. And Johan Libber is a Disruption Specialist responsible for Partnership Office at the Development Bank of Southern Africa. Anya and Johan, thanks so much for your time. Welcome to Morning Live. And um, Anya, I'm going to start with you. So South Africa's water resources are at a critical point at this stage. And I think all South Africans can feel this because suddenly we have not only a load shedding, but water uh, disruptions ever so often as well. Um, now, looking at what is happening, are we uh, facing a water crisis similar to the ongoing electricity crisis at the moment, should, would you say? I would say that it's not just one single crisis. It's uh, a couple of crises together. So, for example, the sewage crisis that basically caused the, the cholera outbreak in Hammond's Kral, that's a very good example. However, there are many sewage pollution um, examples right across the country. The Kreni municipality over December, though it was before the April 2022 floods, you have the Val River that, as well as the Val Dam that's being polluted, the Val Barrage. So sewage has also been a major issue throughout uh, South Africa past 1996. And um, then also other water quality issues include our acidification. An example of that would be the decanting of acid mine drainage within the Western Basin and also the Eastern Basin, and also then the, the Central Basin, which is not decanting at this point in time. Mm. Other water quality issues then also then include salinization, which uh, affect primarily the, the farmers of the country. We have our sedimentation, that is affecting our water storage capacity. Um, and then we also have obviously um, our sewage problem that, that we are currently facing. So that's one factor um, of the systemic collapse that we are currently seeing at this point in time. So water quality is an issue, which then obviously um, contributes to your water scarcity because we can't um, drink uh, um, ill-treated, as we can see now with the Blue Watch Blue Drop Watch report, we can't um, drink dirty water. Uh, and most of our wastewater treatment works aren't working as they should be. That's mostly due to non-maintenance, lack of investment. If there is investment, it might be misappropriation of funds. So it is a uh, multiple of uh, crises in the water sector that is uh, basically now causing with the combination of load shedding um, and all the other factors that we are facing at this point in time within the country, poverty um, and so on, mm. contributing to our overall water crisis. So before I get to Johan about um, the infrastructure question, speaking of water quality, um, Anya, uh, you know, there was a time when uh, some of us uh, were proud of the water quality in our cities and towns, you know, the blue drop status uh, where you would proudly ask not for bottled water, but tap water, even when you went to eat out. Uh, do you think that the reintroduction of the blue, green and no drop watch, um, which was last conducted in 2013, and 2015. Do you think that would perhaps assist to regulate the water sector and quality? I think that is what the Department of Water and Sanitation wanted to do. Unfortunately, if you look at the Blue Watch, Blue Drop Watch report, you can see that most of the wastewater treatment plants or the municipalities, most of them, basically only 50% um, reacted towards the non-compliance letters. And even fewer than that actually ask the Department of Water and Sanitation for assistance, either in terms of skills, capacity or finances. So we have these reports. We have very good legislation. The, the issue that we are sitting with at this point in time is basically compliance and the enforcement thereof. Um, another very um, scary statistic that I saw 
was that 11 municipalities did not have any evidence of testing their drinking water that they're actually supplying to, to the population. Um, and if you look at the report, most of these municipalities either have the equipment and they're not using it, or they don't know how to use it, or they just don't they just, just don't have the equipment. Now, is that the Department of Water and Sanitation's role um, to assist these municipalities? Yes, because the Department of Water and Sanitation, they are the main cus custodian of our water resources. Mm. Um, however, local municipalities are responsible for the management of our water resources. So it's a very complex system. It's lots of role players at play. Um, and I think that hopefully, with the final release of the audit report at the end of July or some, sometime in July, we will get a clearer picture. However, the Blue Watch report, as well as then your green drop and no drop, is not painting a very nice picture at this point in time. Mm, absolutely scary. Um, Johan, you know, if we can come to the infrastructure issue, and unfortunately, we're not talking about some abstract stuff because we see this everywhere we go. Um, now, water infrastructure has been neglected, and this has, of course, led to numerous breakdowns and uh, many towns and cities across the country. But government has set up an office to facilitate uh, private investment in the water industry in order to at least try and arrest uh, the collapse here. Uh, what, uh, would, what would you say uh, uh, would um, uh, that particular infrastructure program mean for the country if it were to be carried out successfully? Yes, uh, Sakina, thank you. Uh, you're 100% correct. I think we know what the problem is and, and Anya has, has highlighted some of those key aspects. One of the things that the, the, the South African government has done and through the Department of Water and Sanitation is the establishment of this uh, Water Partnerships Office. And that's at the back of a, of a national water partnerships program. So the idea with the office, the office is a ring-fenced entity being housed within the DBSA. But the primary focus of the, of the Water Partnerships Office is to see how we can support municipalities specifically municipalities looking at water services side on, on how to address some of the challenges that, that we are experiencing. We know that municipalities are struggling, they're struggling with funding, they're struggling with capacity, with expertise and skills to execute the mandate when it comes to water and sanitation. At the same time, we know that there's a lot of, of, of that skill, expertise and funding within the private sector. And we need to find mechanisms to bring the two together, see how we can get the private sector more involved to assist municipalities, to raise funding for these projects, and then to, to ensure that the execution happens, that the operation and maintenance happens. And, and that is really what the Water Partnerships Office is intended to do. So it's a, it's a center of excellence uh, focusing on, on primary programs, and I can share some of the details on the programs that we are working with. And within each one of these standardized programs, uh, develop approaches and, and make it easier for municipalities to prepare projects, to structure projects, so that we can get the private sector more involved and, and assist government. Government cannot do this alone. We, we just don't have the capacity. So we need to, to leverage the private sector expertise, funding and skills to ensure that we can address uh, the challenges that we are facing. Mm. But how soon can we do that, Jan? Because as we speak, uh, you look at the estimates and uh, it states that uh, around 37% of South Africa's clean uh, portable water is being lost and it's wasted through poor infrastructure uh, such as uh, leaking pipes. So how soon can we get onto this? So, Kina, yes, the, 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 unfortunately, it's not something that's going to happen overnight. You know, a, lo a lot of times these, these large projects require uh, adequate pro project preparation. Uh, it takes time to do proper feasibility studies and structuring, especially if you want to start involving the private sector. Having said that, it's not that nothing has been done. There's, in many cases, municipalities, and specifically in our metro spaces, there's already work that's, that's progressed quite, quite far, um, and, and we, we need to leverage and build on those, and then at the same time start with the other projects that's a bit further behind, that requires more structuring and more preparation. 
in order to get them ready. There is, however, you know, there, there are quick wins. There, there are ways in which we can uh, get get the private sector involved at, at an earlier stage. You mentioned the, the leaking leaking pipes, and, and that's part of the, the non-revenue water program that, that we are working on to see how we can assist municipalities to uh, to reduce their physical losses, to reduce um, revenue losses, increase their cost recoveries, and ring fence that, and, and get the private sector to come in and finance those those initiatives. So I think it's a combination of of, of earlier stage uh, project preparation, but then leveraging on on the projects that's already progressed uh, to a certain uh, to a certain stage, and and see how we can can then fast track the implementation thereof. I think, you know, this is the start of a conversation. 20 seconds, and I literally mean that, Anya. Uh, just with regard to looking at what is happening, you speak about, you know, the sewer spills, the water quality or the lack thereof, and how this is affecting in the main poor communities in this country. This is a rights issue. So what needs to be done in order to ensure that all communities actually have safe drinking water as enshrined in the Constitution? Well, I would say that we need to have uh, actual compliance and actual enforcement and that there's actual accountability at this point in time. I do know and I understand with I, I agree with you, Han, in terms of the projects. However, that is a long term thing. Um, if you tell that to the Hamas Kural community who lost over 20 people within their communities, we should never have gotten to that stage. Um, for, for 20 seconds, that's a, that's a challenge. But um, for me, I, I just I just ask for accountability and transparency at this point in time so that we can build trust with the private sector um, so that they are willing to, to work with government. Well, we have to leave it there. Thanks so much for your time. Anya Duplessis, Associate Professor and Research Specialist in Water Resource Management at the University of South Africa, and Johan Liber, Disruption Specialist responsible for Partnerships Office at the Development Bank of Southern Africa. And speaking, of course, about the water challenges in the country.